Policy Forum lecture. Um, my name is Shekhar Shah. I am the director of the National Council of Applied Economic Research. And the India Policy Forum is in its ninth year, so this is the ninth continuous year. Uh, it also represents a unique partnership between NCAER in Delhi and Brookings uh, in Washington. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, Barry Bosworth is here from Brookings, a steady partner for the last few years. Um, maybe just a word about the India Policy Forum first, and then I want to have the pleasure of introducing our guest and keynote speaker, Dr. Y.V. Reddy, uh, uh, who really doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'm going to introduce him and then request him to release the uh, annual volume of the India Policy Forum, um, the, the issue that publishes the uh, uh, professional papers that are presented at the India Policy Forum. The India Policy Forum started in 2004 um, uh, and was started, as I said, as a partnership between NCAER and Brookings. Um, there was a strong need, uh, and many people subscribed to this view, that more work needs to be done uh, on India. Uh, but this is not work that is done only by people living in India. It should be a global effort to catalyze uh, more research, more evidence-based policy discussion on India. And that led to a format where a conference uh, happens every year in July. Uh, we choose uh, high-quality uh, empirical papers uh, papers that push the frontier of evidence-based analysis and thinking uh, on the Indian economy, on the kind of social and economic transformation that's happening, uh, perhaps one of the biggest social transformations that is happening globally, and to be able to develop insights and explore issues that are of uh, great concern to many of us, both within India and outside India. So the IPF uh, has uh, uh, a a uh, set of two research panels, an advisory panel and a research panel. Uh, these are people who are immensely interested in India, mostly economists, uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, all involved in the thinking and in the selection of papers and in the commentary that is offered uh, at the India Policy Forum on these papers. Uh, so we've just had the first day of the IPF 2012 and we will conclude tomorrow with a further set of sessions. But a highlight of the IPF every year is the IPF lecture. Uh, and I think in the brochure that uh, is outside, some of you will have seen it, uh, you have a listing of all the uh, IPF lectures that have happened uh, over the years. Uh, and it's really, when I first saw it uh, put together in that way, it was really very gratifying to see the range of issues that have been tackled. And uh, with much excitement, we anticipate uh, uh, the lecture today as well. Um, uh, and I'm sure that we will not be disappointed. So let me turn to uh, introducing our uh, chief guest, uh, Dr. Vai Vui Reddy, uh, former governor of the Reserve Bank of India, but much, much, much more, as uh, I'm sure almost everybody in this, uh, in this auditorium knows. Um, he was the, as I said, Governor RBI from 2003 to 2008. Uh, and since then, of course, has gone on to do a number of different things, including being a member of the UN Commission of Experts uh, to the President of the UN General Assembly uh, on reforms of the international monetary and financial system. Uh, currently, he's Professor Emeritus at the University of Hyderabad and a distinguished professor at IIT Madras. He's also an honorary fellow of the London School of Economics. Uh, he's on the advisory board of a number of uh, uh, globally uh, well-established institutions, uh, including the Columbia Program uh, on Indian Economic Policies uh, in New York. Um, he's done a number of different things, uh, and uh, I'm hoping that we see much more of him. Uh, at least this is my own personal uh, feeling. We need to see much more of Dr. Reddy uh, in Delhi as well. So it's a great pleasure to, uh, to, to have Dr. Reddy with us. And as I said, we anticipate um, with great pleasure his, his lecture. I should mention uh, some of his most recent books. Um, 
managing money the global on the global financial crisis, managing money in finance, uh, was uh, an outstanding uh, bestseller in India, uh, published by Orient uh, Black Swan. Uh, and his most recent book, of course, has been titled Global Crisis, Recession, and Uneven Recovery, a book that I would recommend to all of you. As, uh, of course, all of us know, uh, Dr. Reddy was the recipient in 2010 of the Padma Vibhushan, India's uh, second highest civilian uh, award. Um, I should mention, before I introduce uh, Dr. Reddy and ask him to release the volume, I want to acknowledge the support of uh, our corporate uh, partners uh, who have been with IPF uh, uh, over the years. And uh, I particularly want to mention the State Bank of India. Uh, I want to mention the uh, 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 HDFC uh, group, uh, uh, IDFC publisher Sage, and Citibank. Uh, and I'm very grateful for their support uh, for this ongoing uh, commitment to good policy research and good discussion. With that, let me uh, turn to Dr. Reddy and ask him to release the, the, the IPF volume uh, and thereafter uh, to uh, give his speech at the uh, and I find world-renowned distinguished economists assembled here. I'm humble and uh, I can't name so many of them that the next half an hour will be taken away by that. So I'm uh, uh, greatly honored to be sitting here and at the outset I want to confess that what I say is not based on any scholarly work, it is not based on research, it means it is perhaps pretty much opinionated, and I must confess that. And therefore, this is a matter, in a way, it's more an agenda for research for the distinguished economists uh, than a research finding. I am also grateful to you, sir, for, um, uh, for introducing me, starting uh, with the statement that Dr. Reddy needs no introduction. That was the standard line when I was governor. They used to say, he needs no introduction, he needs only a conclusion. <laughs> and, and generally, the major criticism was that I was not giving forward guidance. And therefore, I keep talking and don't give forward guidance. And I always used to confess that I was very honest and I was sharing my confusion with them. <laughs> and I also used to tell them that if I knew the future, I'll be playing the markets and I'll not be serving as governor. So I must confess that I have a record of not knowing the future and confessing about it. And uh, having said that, mm, uh, I thought that I will uh, pick up the subject, um, new strategies for economic development, because a lot of discussion on reform. So in a way, it should be put a question mark there. Strategy, new strategies for economic development, a question mark. Um, because uh, there's one thing, there is, in, the, 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 there is a lot of discussion about speedy implementation of reforms, uh, or a new generation of reforms which could mean that is, is, that are we talking of the reforms uh, of the same DNA uh, before the crisis. So that's the type of issue. So in a way, uh, what I'm trying to say is we have to re-examine the strategies of economic development in, term, in, in view of a recent developments in India, which reflect some uh, socio-political factors, perhaps, uh, a second, recent developments in other emerging market economies, which are becoming more important, and our relationship with other emerging market economies are going to be more than in the past, and we, we have to be very conscious of what are the developments there. And third, the, what are the tentative lessons from the global financial crisis? Uh, very tentative, but they, we must be prepared to take some lessons. And then, what are the prospects for the global economy? 
uh, in the future, medium to long term. And once we have a, some sort of a, uh, assessment uh, uh, of these, then we can say, ah, should we have a relook at the strategies? And that's what I'm going to do, run through quickly. First, a very oversimplified over version of the very recent developments and uh, current status. Uh, one, in India, one, growth in output stalled, though still at a respectable level by global standards. Two, reduction in domestic savings, especially financial savings of households is striking. Three, inflation is persisting at a high level with no clear sign of moderation in underlying pressures. Four, external sector is under stress, exhibited by higher current account deficit, stagnant reserves, higher proportion of short-term borrowings and portfolio flows in stock of external liabilities. Also a fear of depreciation. More recent moderation in the pressure on rupee could be partly on account of stock adjustments in response to liberalization of capital account. That may not, there may not be an assured flow. Five, there is a fiscal stress due to persistent revenue and fiscal deficits, especially in union government, with considerable structural elements and underlying current obligations, not yet just payments due, not paid, is quite a large amount in both the central and state budget. So in a way, the fiscal deficit and revenue deficit may be understated. The maturity structure of debt indicates greater rollover risks. It is true that public debt to GDP has not deteriorated significantly, but that was, for major part, on account of high inflation reflected in nominal growth rate. The burden of such adjustment has been borne by bondholders, especially banking system, which is obliged to hold a large part of the government paper. Six, the financial sector continues to be dominated by the banking sector, which continues to be robust, though there is some stress due to mounting non-performing assets. The major source of domestic funding of financial market transactions continues to be from banking system. Whatever, quite a lot of bond market or whatever the markets we are talking of, essentially the money comes from the banking system. Most of it comes from the banking system. The indicators of participation of savers in financial markets, that is other than banks, in terms of number of savers and amounts as a proportion of their savings is coming down. These show declining public confidence in the perceived integrity of financial markets. And banks are the only safe place left, are the, the institutions where there is confidence for the household savers. Way forward, what are the issues? First, and this, this is basically reflecting the recent uh, developments. So first, how much of the deterioration is on account of domestic problems and how much global? Two, how much of the deterioration is cyclical and how much is structural and fundamental? Three, how far will the continuation of reforms and the contemplation address the issues of both domestic and global structural factors? To what, five, to what extent should reform agenda in India take cognizance of structural transformations in other emerging market economies who are emerging as systemically important for the global economy. Five, how much should our reforms agenda take cognizance of emerging global developments? In this background, I would like to quickly run through um, the recent developments in emerging market economies. These are very broad generalizations, as you would appreciate, and emerging market economies is quite a, uh, quite a diverse basket. But I'll focus a little more on um, Asia and perhaps BRICS. One, growth is stalling in other EMEs also, but in an uneven way, with, still, with India still among the, among the fastest growing, though the dip in growth is significant in India compared to many other countries. Two, inflation is also an upsurge, though not as much as in India. Three, level of domestic savings is uneven, 
but in Asia, the overall savings are equal to or higher than India, though India's household savings are on par with others in Asia. There are attempts in some Asian economies to increase consumption. The external sectors are also facing uncertainties. But unlike India, many of the larger EMAs, EMEs have current account surpluses and ample reserves. Some of the EMEs are more dependent on commodity exports than India, with implications for future surpluses, depending on the course of the commodity prices in the, uh, 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 in the global economy. Financial sector in most of them is bank-based, and the size of debt markets as well as derivatives is not large. While there has been fiscal stress in many, many countries, almost all of them have lower GDP debt GDP ratios and greater headroom for fiscal actions relative to India. Headroom for monetary actions is under stress in most EMEs, but they may have more headroom than India. Some of the EMEs are struggling to rebalance their economies towards stimulating domestic demand and encouraging consumption to make up for slack in export demand, contrary to India where domestic demand pressures and government consumption are high. So what are the issues that we may have to analyze in this background? A, is India performing worse than other EMEs in macroeconomic terms? B, is India more vulnerable or less vulnerable to shocks on current account and on capital account relative to other EMEs? C, what is the policy space or headroom available relative to emerging challenges in India in, uh, compared to other EMEs? Four, what will be the nature of interaction between India and other emerging market economies in terms of trade and investment, recognizing that EME share in global economy and global trade will be expanding in future? Finally, how should India position itself vis-à-vis -vis other emerging market economies in the global economy in future. I will quickly narrate tentative lessons from the global financial crisis, recognizing that we have not seen the end of the crisis, and our lessons are very tentative. In the financial sector, A, there is a review of links between real and financial sector, and possible, and there is a recognition, at least in the recent BIS annual meeting, there is a recognition of possible dangers of quote-unquote excessive financialization. Two, excessive leverage could have potential for crisis. It's now, nowadays being described as the great leverage. C, banking activity is special, retail banking activity. And so, either banks are special or the activity of retail banking has to be ring-fenced, whether we call it Wicker Rule, Volcker Rule, or whatever it is. Wholesale funding is less stable than retail deposits. Asset-based lending and bank credit may have less adverse consequences when the, when the credit expands. Shadow banking and innovations have toxic potential. The financial institutions can be too big to fail and indeed may be too big to regulate. Regulatory capture should be guarded against. Regulation at national level needs to be strengthened and should be counter-cyclical with emphasis on macro-prudential aspects. I'm not saying there is unanimity on this, but this is the shift in the balance of thinking. Coordination between fiscal, monetary, and financial sector policies needs to be ensured in public sector while avoiding conflicts of interest and adverse incentives in private sector. There is a slight shift. Earlier in the discussion, the, the discussion was how to avoid conflicts of interest among the public sector agencies. Uh, where are, uh, and where in private enterprise, it was economies of scale and scope, and then only creating the walls. And now there is a recognition that the Chinese walls don't operate that easily in the private sector. And avoidance of conflict of interest in public sector could result in undermining coordination of public policies. Global coordination of regulation of financial sector should be more effective. 
global financial crisis may be due to great leverage in credit markets or global capital flows and not merely on quote unquote savings glut the reform of financial sector may be in the direction of re-regulation in advanced economies, but in most emerging market economies, it will be in the opposite direction. It has to be more deregulation because of the baggage of uh, financial repression. There is also an issue of financial sector problems have the potential for becoming fiscal problems. There is a huge scope for contagion in finance. There is evidence of stalling of deregulation in many emerging market economies in finance. The search, in brief, the search for a new ideal of finance and the path towards it are under review. The future of finance in, is under discussion. And because of the link between fiscal and finance, there are some some deeper issues that have to be considered. One, fiscal sustainability and financial sector vulnerabilities are closely linked. Virtual deposit insurance for retail deposits is inevitable. Taxation of financial sector, both institutions and market transactions, may not be entirely inappropriate. Holding of public debt, who holds and in which currency it is denominated is important. There is a thin line between monetary and fiscal measures during extraordinary times. External sector. The international monetary system admittedly was one of the causes of the crisis. It's a non-system with no real viable alternatives so far. Global financial architecture is somewhat flawed despite recent improvements and promise of further improvements. Global economic coordination is complex and there are no clear signs of improvements despite initial success of G20. Current account balances do matter, especially for emerging market economies. Volatility in capital flows does matter. Intervention in forex markets is not a sin advanced economies that much depends on how you define extraordinary circumstance. Gross and net capital flows are different and the increasing gap between gross inflows and net inflows or gross outflows and net inflows, net outflows, they pose challenges to policy, whether advanced economies or emerging market economies. Emerging market economies with adequate reserves as insurance were less impacted by the recent crisis. There is increasing recognition that public policy in emerging market economies could, should constantly review external sector developments along with other macro variables with a view to intervene as appropriate. Now let me come to prospects for global economy. And again, I'm making more sort of a telegraphic language points and not necessarily that each one of them can be asserted as true, but this is at least tendentious. Short term, there are three issues. One, volatility in commodity markets, volatility in commodity market prices, which is inevitable because the opposing forces of moderation and demand for commodities, the moderation in growth of economies, and the ample liquidity in the financial sector, in the financial markets. Second, the volatility in financial markets. And three, the spillover of the unconventional measures adopted by systemically important advanced economies. And how unconventional, how long they will be, we do not know. And these three put together impart considerable uncertainties over the short term. Medium to long term, I think there is a recognition that <clears throat> there will be new normal. In other words, it, we may, the world, global economy may not go back to pre-crisis growth rates, pre-crisis situation. What will the new normal be? <clears throat> I think that is something we have to speculate in order to consider appropriate strategies. 
it appears reasonable to hold that the growth rates of the global economy may be less than the pre-crisis, despite the fact that the emerging market economies may grow at a faster rate, their share in the world GDP is not that high. So overall global economy may grow less, the rate of growth may be less than it was pre-crisis. Inflation may be more than it was in the pre-crisis pre period, both because you cannot have huge labor force of China coming in every time, but more important, from a policy side also, the, there is a debate at what is the appropriate level of uh, inflation after the great moderation. Three global capital allocation issues will be very new. Maximum demand for global capital may come from advanced economies for financing their public debt. In a, at a time when uh, their own uh, age profile will be dissaving than saving. So they expect the, the amounts that may be available, so the, the allocation between advanced and developing economies, public and public debt and corporate debt, equity and debt, I think that is likely to be entirely a new ballgame. Global demography may warrant migration policies across the global economy, including among EMEs. Global monetary system, especially reserve currencies, will be unstable. With US dollar under threat, but at the same time, it continues to be the safe haven. So because the uncertainty is everybody wants to go to the dollar, US dollar, but at the same time, everybody recognizes that its supremacy is under threat. Global coordination of financial regulation may be contentious and is uncertain. Global power balances among countries are under a flux. But technology will continue to drive society and the economies with rewards for competitive efficiency and growth in productivity. So my submission is that there is only one certainty for the future of the global economy, and that is Productivity matters. Productivity growth matters. Competitive efficiency matters, period. In this background, how do we build or how do we review uh, our uh, strategies uh, for uh, public policy? The strengths in our economy should be reinforced. I think that will be the highest priority. Second, Buffers against vulnerability of our economy should be strengthened. Three, global opportunities and threats, in particular developments in other emerging market economies, should be built into our strategy. What are our strengths? High domestic savings, especially household savings. Two, dynamic entrepreneurial talent and low cost Per unit of innovation, it is generally said that China may have advantage of low cost of production, but low cost of innovation is in their strength. A large labor force. Banking sector that did not face a systemic crisis. Competition among state governments and diversity in their developmental policies. What are our vulnerabilities? Again, I'm mentioning some of them. I would say the most important is vulnerability to shocks on current account. Fuel and food. We are dependent on imported fuel. And if there is any shortage in food, the amount of demand due to that shortage is going to be a large proportion of the, of the global supply of the commodities, apart from the basket of commodities also. Second, we are more vulnerable for capital account shocks. Third, and more important, they reinforce each other. Invariably, the capital accounts, and you, and, and you have to take the stock, it's not the flow. If the stock, of the, what happens is whenever in capital account, unlike in current account, in current account it's a food shortage or fuel shortage. In, in capital account, once the sentiment moves, it's the stock adjustment that takes place. And the stock adjustment takes place through current flows, and that can be huge. And this happens at a time when you are vulnerable to, when, when there is a current account shock. Second, dependence on external flows 
and share of volatile flows in the stock and uh, in an uncertain environment. Three, fiscal weaknesses in terms of quantity and quality, both on revenue and on capital account. Financial markets that do not inspire confidence of people of India in terms of their integrity, as I mentioned, if you look at the household savings, behavior of the household say, financial savings. Sectoral deficiencies, especially in physical and social infrastructure. And then, of course, the broader issues of governance systems, which are complex. In this background, what should be the framework for new strategies? And I will only explore uh, with uh, sort of on a judgmental basis. And I'm emphasizing that the new strategy should think of macroeconomic policies for rapid development of Indian economy on an assured basis. Because the nature of the society and the nature of the polity is such that its capacity to absorb volatility in growth and employment is less than many other societies. That's just a judgment. I believe there are five or six important issues which we have to address in considering possible new strategies. One, zero current account deficit over medium term should be the cornerstone of the policy. The logic is simple. We recognize, especially after the recent experience, that any, when the current account deficit exceeds 3%, there, is, there are jitters in the global financial markets. That has been the experience. Actually, we went on, uh, we proceeded after 1992-93, if you recall, Rangarajan Committee of which I was the member secretary. We, we treated 2% as a sustainable current account deficit, but we did not make a distinction between a ceiling and an average. And then subsequently, we moved out to 3%. And then the next fire plan, if I am not mistaken, assumes 2.5% 2, 2 current account deficit. So if you are talking of 2.5% average, then in the years when you are subjected to shock, it will become 5%. And that, I don't think the system will be able to exceed that. Uh, at least the international financial markets will be able to absorb. So if this presumption is true, or if this assumption is true, the, then we may have to target for zero current account deficit. Then that provides 2 to 3% headroom in any year to absorb the shocks. Also, if you look at the empirical evidence of the last 20 to 30 years, of the countries, emerging market economies, who have rapidly grown. My impression is that not many countries have had their development financed by current account deficits. Quite a few of them had current account surpluses and still grew. So this is a question mark. If this is the vulnerability to shocks, should our medium-term growth strategy be based on zero current account deficit? It doesn't mean the current account will be smaller. The current account can be larger as it is happening for many Asian economies. The exports and imports may be larger, but the deficit will have to be close to zero on average or the medium term one. The second proposition is focus on a new domestic savings investment balance, which follows from the first in some senses. The growth in GDP could be maintained despite zero current account deficit policy if the domestic savings, which are less unstable, are enhanced by 3% of GDP or by 10% over the current level. A combination of fiscal policy, zero revenue deficit, and monetary policy with focus on domestic savings and financial sector policy making it friendly to household savings should be able to achieve this. Economy is unlikely to be demand starved due to demography and possible underlying growth. And hence, investments should follow if policy environment is hassle free with no need for fiscal props for investments. Briefly, you ooh domestic savers, there's a better payoff and more stable payoff. In fact, there is evidence to show that the tax regime and even the investment regime is somewhat less friendly to the domestic savers. And we are seeing it through the 
round tripping that keeps happening. Third, fiscal empowerment and higher outlays on public goods. Zero revenue deficit except during emergency to be mandated for both center and states. That's one which is, you know, is important. Second, public investments in social and physical infrastructure are big bottlenecks and they warrant higher outlays. It is true public-private particip participation is possible, it can be considered, but we should always be aware that in infrastructure, in any public-private sector participation, the ultimate risk bearer is the state. There is some sort of invariable guarantee that you have to get. So the, 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 risks, do, the risks do devolve on public sector. Any problem? Or? Oh, I'm sorry. I put on silent. I should have put on uh, off. Sorry, sir. Um, we have been focusing on subsidies and the inefficiency in subsidies. Should we? It's off. <laughs> is it time? No. <laughs> Your phone is not reminding you. <laughs> Uh, I think we have been focusing on the efficiency of uh, subsidies, but not efficiency of incentives. And if we are giving export incentives, what is the export uh, output? Because a tax is an a tax concession is an entitlement. It's an entitlement, uh, and 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 therefore, if you see the payoff, and uh, then maybe we'll get a slightly different picture. And we are not looking at my limited point and and a strategy. Where, as I explained, where uh, you look at uh, a link, what are incentives if needed. So, in a way, uh, we have to seriously examine the payoff of the quote unquote incentives. The standard, uh, uh, the standard line is that when you give some something to poor people, it's subsidy. If you give it to rich people, it is incentive. Uh, next, financial sector uh, to serve the broader objectives. One, the integrity of the financial sector should be enhanced so that savers, domestic household savers in India, develop confidence in financial markets. Yes, we have some tax shops for investments in certain instruments, but I think the, considering the risks, the tax, the household savers are, do not seem to be responding favorably uh, to such uh, tax incentives because the basic integrity of the financial markets uh, is yet to be established. The external policy constraints on banking, I'm repeating, the external policy on constraints on banking should be removed. We cannot expect serious reform of the banking sector and therefore the financial sector. If you ask them to produce 25% uh, SLR uh, every time, just, just to be able to get the government or push the government borrowing program through. For banks, a focus on asset-based lending and retail deposits in keeping with the wisdom from the global developments should be considered. In fact, if you just look at all the types of preemptions that we have and the investment banking that is being encouraged for the Indian banks, Indian banks are doing less of retail banking activity in terms of lending. Uh, they are only collecting the deposits, but the lending is not uh, what they should be doing. They're not in the banking business. There's a, systemic, there's a system uh, problem, and this is reflected in the working capital requirements uh, not being met uh, almost across the board. In monetary policy, should be in monetary policy, focus should be equal on money and on credit, in particular on leverage and composition of credit flow. Perhaps the sequencing should be strengthening of domestic financial institutions and financial markets, followed by gradual liberalization of capital accounts, followed by opening of financial sector for foreign financial entities. Politically, it is tempting to remake reforms in financial sector because it can be non-transparent. It will appear like technical change in imbalances, but its impact can be huge on the society and the burden sharing is non-transparent. Finally, you empower the states. First, in order to downsize the risk of centralized policy mistakes, I think it is time we recognize that there may be 
centralized policy mistakes in central, centralized decision making. And we are at a stage of complexities, domestic, economic, social, political, global. There is an advantage in empowering the states and reducing the downside risks of centralized policy making. Two, we can promote competition among development policies among states. They are now big enough. They have a reasonable amount of expertise. And we should be able to look for diverse experimentation. So that you can fa it can facilitate experimentations. And finally, to restore the rightful policy space for states. I will conclude with uh, a quote from my book where I have collected the essays, unpublished works, etc., of Dr. I.G. Patel. And about 10 years ago, I, some of the people may be present here, we had, we have Stanford, uh, Professor Rivasan was there, I think, Stanford Conference, sir, 2003, Stanford Conference, and Dr. I.G. Patel wrote a piece. In fact, in the piece, the first paragraph was what was written by me in Currency and Finance, which was quite optimistic. And then, of course, uh, um, he questioned uh, quite directly, and it's available in published version. He doesn't name me. Uh, but he names my gender, though. Uh, <laughs> so he, 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 and then he writes this, and I'm, I'm, I'm quoting uh, 10 years ago. The time now is not for general preaching of reform, but for more painstaking and detailed work on individual issues and sectors so that rapid corrective action can be taken whenever opportunity arises. It is possible that the strategy that I'm hinting at may imply a revisit about the rate of growth. That can we achieve 10% without that extra 3% foreign savings is an issue. Again, I would like to quote what he said. I'm afraid all, the, in the same speech, I'm afraid all the stock of a 8 or 9% per annum growth in real terms to be achieved on our average over decades is unrealistic and counterproductive. It makes the achievable good look bad by comparison with utopian dreams. All societal, all societies work within limits. I repeat, all societies work within certain limits. There is also the experience of history. One swallow does not make a summer, nor does one China make the world, even if you take it at its word. Thank you very much.